Good evening. I am Roberto Santa Maria, your host this evening for Nantucket Pulse Programming, made possible by Nantucket Cottage Hospital's Community Health Initiative. This is a special edition of the Nantucket Pulse Program that will air weekly covering the coronavirus impacts for the island and will provide urgent updates as they unfold. Today, we are, we are happy to welcome a very special guest to the program, Dr. Jeffrey Drazen. He is the New England Journal of Medicine's group, group editor and a distinguished professor, a distinguished Parker B. Francis professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. He is also on the board of Nantucket Cottage Hospital. We will discuss the current state of the virus and the road ahead. He will then take questions from viewers who are logged into a U the YouTube account and type their questions via the chat feature. We are also grateful to be joined by Jason Graziadeh, Nantucket Cottage Hospital Public Information Officer. He will answer questions during the public Q&A as well. Welcome. Before we dive into the discussion with our special guests, let's review some recent developments on the island and on Beacon Hill. In the, in the Commonwealth, along with the Cent Centers for Disease Control, we recommend that, that everyone wears a mask in environments where it is difficult to socially distance. Please leave N95 and medical grade masks for the medical professionals. A cloth mask will still help. The goal is to reduce the spread of aerosolized water droplets of infected people, many of whom don't even know they are sick. In other news, the Commonwealth has, put, has just passed legislation putting a moratorium on evictum, evictions. Also, MCAS testing requirements for the school year have been suspended. The Department of Elementary and Secondary Education will modify or waive graduation requirements for seniors to finish this year. The Nantucket Cottage Hospital is well stocked with hundreds of COVID-19 test kits. Results are now available within 24 hours. Here's an encouraging statistic. No new confirmed COVID-19 cases have been detected here in the past 15 days. This lull surprises the hospital and they are cautiously optimistic about the slowing of the spread here. Please keep up the social distancing, Nantucket. This critical measure combined with ample testing are the best tools we have besides vaccines, according to the hospital CEO Gary, and, and president Gary Shaw. Without them, one sick person can infect as many as 400 people in a month. The hospital has no plans to create a surge treatment facility. Logistical challenges and the lack of surge me medical staff on the island make that plan unfeasible. Instead, the hospital continues to med, med flight patients to Boston hospitals. If the need arises, there are plans to med flight patients to the new field hospitals like the one that just opened on Joint Base Cape Cod in Bourne. According to WHDH, this facility can take up to 125 COVID-19 patients that do not require ICU level care. The Nantucket Health Department unfortunately has no plans to start seasonal health inspections of restaurants. Even if a restaurant had no violations of the health code last year, if it needs a health inspection now, it must wait indefinitely until the governor's order. This decision comes from the state and the only health inspections permitted from during the stay at home advisory is for essential construction. There was an emergency meeting of the select board and the board of health just hours ago. We are designing phased plans that would gradually let construction and landscaping work resume. We do not yet have a final plan to share with you. The Board of Health will meet this Sunday at 1 p.m. to clarify them further. This meeting can be watched live on this channel and on YouTube at the link, at the link in the description. Now, let's move on to the story that speaks to the communal spirit of Nantucket. The Community Foundation and for Nantucket and Act Saves are raising hundreds of thousands of dollars to help out Nantucket nonprofits. These organizations then pass on the support to many Nantucketers in need. This is a challenging time for many, but efforts like this can help lighten the burden. Yesterday, I spoke to Executive Director of the Community Foundation, Margareta Andrews, and co-founder of Act Saves, Kate Keith, about what they are doing and how much they have raised. When we return, Jason Graziadeh will share a statement from the hospital, and then we will welcome Dr. Drazen to the program. Please enjoy the interview and consider donating if you are available. Oh, absolutely, thank you. We really appreciate a lot of the work that you're doing for the island. So 
I'm just going to go ahead, jump right in. A few questions for Community Foundation here. Um, the Community Foundation created a fund offering support to nonprofits struggling during this pandemic. It's called the Nantucket Food Nantucket Fund for Emergency Relief. How did it get started? Very quickly, <laughs> very organically. I actually was out of town in the middle of March and was starting to hear rumblings across the country about this horrible situation that we were finding ourselves in. And I have a good network of community foundations across the country and started hearing that they were creating emergency relief funds. So I came back to Nantucket by the 18th of March um, and the next day we created a fund. Um, we're very nimble. We can create a fund like that very quickly. And uh, it was up and running and going very quickly. Wow, that is, that's impressive. <laughs> that's very impressive. Um, would you just, can you describe to us how the Community Foundation uses these tiers to decide when or if nonprofits are receiving assistance? So we started, the first thing we needed obviously was to have, have some money in the fund. Um, so the board of the Community Foundation decided to transfer $100,000 over from our discretionary grants fund to this new fund to launch the initiative. Uh, within 24 hours, we had an incredibly generous uh, challenge grant from Remain Nantucket for $250,000. So once we knew we had those dollars in the bank, so to speak, we put out to the nonprofits that we were going to be accepting applications. And I use the word applications quite um, lightly. It is a very streamlined, efficient process, um, not anywhere near as um, cumbersome as our typical application process is. And we let them know that we were going to be prioritizing the applications coming in in three ways, that the first wave of funding would be directed to our nonprofits in the human service sector that are currently open and serving the community and have needs around that, whether it's staffing needs or remote needs, um, supplies, there's lots of different things around that. The next um, tier of priority was aimed at those organizations that provide vital service to the community but are unable to stay open because of the mandated stay at home order. Um, that's specifically our daycare centers and, and uh, small friends and uh, rising tide. They're unable to be open, but we need those services to be ready to go the minute this is lifted because of the, the service they provide to, to our Nantucket community. And then the third sector um, is really the rest of our nonprofits. This is our world. Our community foundation supports all of our nonprofits. And we are very aware that there's going to be a huge reduction in income from lack of programming this summer, certainly lack of fundraising events, the potential of philanthropy kind of ratcheting back a bit given what's going on with our global economy. So we're hoping to grow this fund to a, a corpus where it can really address that once the immediate needs have, have been kind of taken care of. Wow. So that's pretty, that's... Ambition. You're really doing this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, it I is. Up to the challenge, though. <laughs> I, I believe so. I believe so. On all my work that I've done with you, with you and everyone at the foundation, I do believe you are all up to this challenge, and I really appreciate that. Um, we know that there's a subsection to this fund that connects nonprofits and the restaurants to offer meal delivery to those in need. How would that work? Started with the relationship um, with Or the Whale and the Sandbar and the Saltmar Center. Uh, almost four weeks ago now, the uh, restaurants stepped up and started partnering with the Saltmar Center to provide meals to our seniors, 16 above, that didn't qualify for Meals on Wheels. And the program grew very rapidly. Um, they were doing upwards of 50 or 60 meals a night and at no cost, they were, they were not provided, they were not charging anybody these services. And after a couple of weeks, they realized that might not be sustainable for the long term. So we actually had a donor who was very interested in food initiatives on the island, um, looking what Patrick was doing uh, at Island Kitchen with our school kids, and then this relationship, and he pledged $100,000 into this fund, the Emergency Relief Fund, to support initiatives around food and nonprofits throughout the community. So Gene Miller and Carlisle Jensen in my office have been pairing restaurants with nonprofits all week. And it looks like right now, what I heard yesterday, that there will be over 500 meals served this week through this initiative, which is really fun and exciting. Food, food is comfort, food is love, food is what we all kind of need when things are scary. Yes, yes it is. You should be very proud with the work that's being done there. That's, that's a huge deal. Um, and as of right now, how, how much money has the Community Foundation raised and spent for this fund? And how much of it came from on island? So right now we have uh, about $500,000 in the bank, quote unquote, um, that's cash in the door. We have pledges um, equaling that. 
and commitments. So we're looking at a fund that should be, at the end of the day, over a million dollars, which is amazing. Our donors, we, we are only taking the credit for facilitating this. Our donors are the ones that need the thanks here. They're the ones that stepped up, sometimes unsolicited, large $25,000, $30,000 donations coming in the door that we were not expecting. And just the outpouring is incredible. On island giving, I mean, I, you know, how to, hard to quantify on island giving because everybody who has donated has a, a foothold in Nantucket, whether they're here right now or not. So we received um, some business support. There are local banks that stepped up hugely. Uh, it's been incredible. So we're looking at over a million dollars. We, I don't believe that's going to be anywhere near enough, quite honestly. We have processed and sent out grants um, uh, to about just over uh, $275,000 as of yesterday. And those are all the applications that have come in to date that address the first two areas of priority. Wow. Is there any specific area before I let you, before we move on to a little bit, is there any, uh, is there a website that you would like us, that you want people to go to? Is there a phone number that you would like us to call? Yeah, our website, our whole homepage is dedicated to this fund. So it's uh, cfnan.org. Um, call our office, but that won't go to our office because we're working remotely. So Dion will be happy to route your call to whoever you want to speak to. The, the need here is significant. It's, it's going to be, I think the immediate need is a little easier to quantify, quite honestly. The long-term need in the community around the nonprofit sector, which is my world, is going to be pretty staggering. Um, you know how much the nonprofits rely on fundraising and events and programming. And we don't know what this summer is going to look like. You have had many people on your show lately saying, this may be the summer that wasn't. We, we really don't know what it's gonna look like. So our goal through this fund is to make our nonprofit sector as whole as possible and be able to go into 2021 as strong as possible. Well, thank you. Thank you and the foundation and to all the donors. That is a big one. That Absolutely, 100%. Thank you. That is, that is very big. And um, we're gonna move on to Kate. And uh, Kate with Act Saves, could you give us a quick rundown on Act Saves and um, where does the money that Act Saves raises, where does that go? Well, first of all, I want to say how eloquently put that was, Margareta, you're a hard act to follow. But <laughs> Act Saves, we're, like Margareta I made reference to, it's, the whole process has been extremely fluid and very nimble. Uh, we just got this up and started, Act Saves, that is. Uh, two weeks ago started the process and I think maybe five days ago got it operational. Um, so Act Saves was started by a few people on the island, uh, myself included, that recognized a need by individuals for assistance. And um, it, it's different from the fund that Margareta was referencing in that instead of the money we raise from donors going to nonprofits, our funds from Act Saves go to individuals that have an immediate need. And again, it's through Nantucket Food, Fuel, and Rental Assistance Program that these funds get distributed. And it is, again, uh, an application to fill out that isn't as cumbersome as it, any, as the applications normally would be. Because we want to make sure that people, there's not red tape in order for people to get the funds that they need and they get them as soon as possible. So we have three founders and an advisory group. And the advisory group is made up of uh, civic leaders and um, individuals, say for instance, that um, run the landscaping association or the builders association or the lodging association and where they have relationships that throughout the island where they can reach out to two different groups of people the people in need because they're in contact with them and also potential donors um, people that they work for um, as opposed to people who might work for them and we're trying to tap a donor base. Act Saves, our, our purpose right now is solely to raise funds and to outreach. The Community Foundation for Nantucket collects those funds. You go on our website, there's a direct link to donate that goes to the Community, funds, uh, fund, the community Foundation's fund page. And then 
Those funds will be distributed, like I said, through the Nantucket Food, Fuel, and Rental Assistance Program. So right now, we have reached out to our email list and our any personal relationship we have with somebody who loves Nantucket like we do and ask for their help in assisting and, and donating. And that's what we'll continue to do because we need to raise funds. We Like Margareta made reference to, we can't quantify the need moving forward, what the emergent need is. Uh, we certainly are getting a good picture of what the immediate need is. And, um, and I think it's just going to be a very long summer for a lot of people here. Um, so many people on this island make their living June, July, and August, and it's not going to be reflective of any summer I think we've had here to date. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. Um, about the advisory group, can you run us through like what the, the value added group that they do, um, the value of the advisory group and the work that you're doing? Uh, their value is their connections, basically. You know, they're our connection to all the islanders in their individual groups, the hotel business, the landscaping business, the builders who deal with all the contractors. Um, it's the it's all the people in the community that might need help that will go to these people, uh, these individuals on the advisory group, asking maybe for their help, maybe for their advice, and they're reaching out to them and anybody who works for them to let them know that there are these funds available through the Community Foundation and um, specifically the Act Saves. So you mentioned that Act Saves uh, raises its money uh, through the Community Foundation. Uh, can you run us through the, uh, the fundraising efforts and just how, how much have been raised so far? Uh, well, like we said, we're, we're, we just got up and running, I think, on Saturday. And I think to date we have 25,000 with uh, the potential for a lot more. We have lots of promises and lots of emails uh, coming back to us saying they received our letters and they're sending in checks and wiring money. So, uh, you know, it, like I said, it's fluid. I think we have uh, a lot of great promises out there as we hope to see um, a lot more in the account by the end of the week. And as soon as it comes in, it will go out. <laughs> that sounds great. Um, can you point us towards a, a, a website or a phone number so that we can avail ourselves of this information? And if we would like to make a donation, how would we get a hold of you? Okay, you can either go on the Community Foundation for Nantucket website, uh, the CFNAN, or our website, which is actsaves.org. We have a link that goes directly to the foundation. Excellent. Well, Kate, Margareta, uh, that's all the questions I have for you two today. Um, we really appreciate the work that you're doing to help those on island. We really thank the donors for everything that they have done. And we're back. So thank you for uh, Nantucket Community Foundation and Axes for all the work that they're doing. It's um, it's a big deal, and uh, we really appreciate the work that we're doing that they're doing there. And uh, now we have uh, Jason Grazia Day uh, from our hospital. Uh, Jason will be uh, issuing our statement from the hospital now, and we really appreciate all the work that you're doing. Jason, how are you doing today? Good, good. Thanks, Roberto. Thanks for having me on your show. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, good evening, everyone. I'm Jason Grazia today. I'm the public information officer for Nantucket Cottage Hospital. Uh, on behalf of everyone at the hospital, I first want to say thank you to everyone on Nantucket for all the support we've received. Um, there's been so many donations of supplies, masks, food, or just simple gestures of support. So I don't want to single out any one business or individual, but just say thank you to everyone. Um, to give you an update of what we've seen um, at the hospital, um, as of this afternoon, April 17th, uh, we have tested 224 patients for COVID-19. Uh, 203 of those patients have tested negative for COVID-19, and we have 
as you probably know, 10 confirmed cases. Uh, it has been 14 days since our last positive case. Um, and of those patients who have been diagnosed with COVID-19, uh, six of them have recovered and three of them remain uh, in isolation and following precautions. Um, and sadly, as you know, we did have one death at the hospital as a result of complications from the disease. Um, so we continue to test patients outside of the uh, hospital at our mobile drive-through evaluation site. Um, this site is intended for patients experiencing symptoms of respiratory illness. So uh, patients who are tested there can expect a turnaround time for results of generally 24 hours. So if you get there uh, before three o'clock, which is typically when we send off our tests, you can get a 24 hour turnaround time. The hours of operation at the drive-through are 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. and 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. daily. Um, the testing capacity, uh, which Roberto mentioned earlier, um, it's still constrained both nationally and statewide. We have been able to expand testing capacity slightly on the island, which is a good thing. And our clinical team is able to test those individuals they feel have a need to be tested at the drive through if they meet criteria, really if they're symptomatic. Um, the criteria has become less restrictive than it was in the beginning. Um, and we've able to expand testing to, to include um, women admitted to our labor and delivery unit. So all women coming into the um, maternity ward are tested as well as their spouses. We, now, uh, we know that more testing is better and we are looking at every way we can to expand the, our capacity and evaluating any potential opportunity to do so. Um, we want the community to know that the hospital is open to patients who need care for non-COVID medical issues. Um, and we're taking all the appropriate steps to safely expand access to our services as much as possible while we still are in this response mode to the pandemic. So we're seeing patients in person uh, in the physician clinic uh, for the same day and next day appointments that are urgent appointments, as well as through virtual visits um, and on the phone or by video. So if you have a need, a medical need, please call us and we'll absolutely do our best to take care of you in any way that we can. Um, while we have not had a new case of COVID-19 for 14 days, as I mentioned earlier, we do not want that fact to let us become complacent. Everything we have been doing in terms of physical distancing, hand washing, limiting our trips to the grocery store and wearing masks are all still extremely important and they are working. Um, we're absolutely concerned about the impact of an influx of people to the island in the weeks and months ahead. But all that being said, we do absolutely want to acknowledge the success our community has had um, with limiting the spread of COVID-19. And together with the select board and the board of health, um, we are working as uh, Roberto, Roberto mentioned on taking some small step towards loosening some of the restrictions that have been in place on certain industries to allow a limited number of people uh, to safely and responsibly get back to work. Um, and with that, I, I just want to repeat something that Dr. Pearl, Dr. Diane Pearl, who's our chief medical officer, said during uh, today's joint select board and board of health meeting. So what Dr. Pearl said is, we do have a low level of COVID-19 on the island. We don't have a lot of sick people or positive, te positive tests. In fact, we haven't had any for 14 days, as, as I said before. The epidemiologists and the physicians who we talk to in Boston are just amazed by this. They're shocked our community can be this isolated and have such a low volume. Um, we do think though that the collateral damage of people not working is very serious in the community with violence, uh, domestic violence, drugs and alcohol, um, poverty, you know, potential suicide ideations, depression, stress, things like that. So we've tried to come up with the compromises that we, and we know that we can't stay isolated until a vaccine is developed a year and a half from now. So uh, we can't stay the way we are in Nantucket. That's not viable in terms of what the shutdown we know, you know, has been for the reality that has been. So we have to move forward. And the safest way to do that is continuing to do wearing masks, doing the physical distancing, hand washing, and moving back into life in a measured, slow and safe manner. Um, at the hospital, we are better prepared now um, because we had prepared for such a larger amount of infection. We're prepared for the consequences of these actions that we're taking now, which we feel will be minimal, if any, based on what we know about the island at this moment. So with that, uh, I wanna say thank you again to everyone on Nantucket for supporting the hospital, and we'll move into the next segment of the show.
Awesome. Thank you so much, Jason. We really appreciate the hospital statement. And um, we're sorry that, Jer uh, that Gary Shaw couldn't join us today. Um, but we are really grateful for all the wisdom and the information that he keeps providing us and a lot of the guidance. Uh, I know the boards, uh, both the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Health are really appreciative of the work that Dr. Pearl, uh, Gary Shaw, the board of Nantucket Cottage Hospital, and you yourself have been uh, invaluable for the work that we're doing. So we thank you. Well, thank you, and, and back right back at you guys, because we know how much work that the town and the EOC and the Board of Health and all everything that you guys have been doing is uh, working around the clock and dealing with very difficult decisions and a lot of pressure on both sides, you know, keep it closed down, open it back up. So um, definitely thank you to you guys as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. So what we're looking to do now is the conversation for to bring in Dr. Drazen. So in a programming note, we will have a discussion among the guests about COVID-19 with our special guest, Dr. Drazen. If you would like more background about the virus, please tune in to Channel 18 on Saturday, April 18th and Sunday, April 19th at 8 p.m. to watch Dr. Drazen's fascinating lecture, The Unfolding Story of the Coronavirus. He not only explores its origin, but compares its spread to that of other viruses and finishes by assessing the best ways to combat it. After our discussion today, I will announce the beginning of the Q&A session and, uh, on YouTube, and if the chat session is still disabled, make sure you re refresh it uh, so that you can still enable to chat. Uh, welcome, Dr. Drazen. How are you doing today? Good, and you guys, you look, sound like you're doing good, too. We feel pretty good. Absolutely. Thank you. As nice so, kind. <laughs> yes. So we'll jump right in. Um, how, how do you feel Nantucket is comparing to the mainland from your experience as a doctor and uh, the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, which is an amazing and feat by, in and of itself? How do you feel and see this rolling out here? So the... the um, actually, it's better than good news. It's awesome news the, that the community has been able to suppress uh, the virus uh, to the extent that it has. There's a lot of travel on and off the island, uh, but through a combination of social distancing and uh, strict uh, measures, the community has really been very successful at keeping the infection rate uh, below what anybody had predicted. So that's the good news. And the bad news that comes with the good news is that we have to figure a way out. And there are only uh, two ways out of this. One way is for us to have a vaccine or a really good therapeutic, a drug that can be used easily and affordably to treat the virus. Neither one of those is something that's on the horizon for the next few months. Even if we, had a, a, we knew next week that a vaccine or a drug worked, to be able to produce it in the quantity needed uh, for the world uh, would require months of effort. So we're left with the second thing. We either have to keep cases off of Nantucket, which will turn out to be very difficult, if not impossible, because almost a third of the people that have this virus don't know it. And if you don't know you have the disease, um, it's easy to spread it unless we're in a lockdown situation. So it's certainly possible that somebody who feels really well could come to the island and spread the disease. In fact, there may be more disease on Nantucket than we know about because the only people who've been tested have been those who've become symptomatic. So the other way for immunity to take place is for the illness to exist on the island long enough for there to be enough people with immunity that the virus can't find a fresh host. And what we've done so far is we've prevented the vaccine, the virus, as far as we know, from multiplying on the island. But it's inevitable that it will. And what we need to do is to make sure that it happens in a way that doesn't lead to the situations that they've had in New York and in Italy, where there are patients dying in the hallways because the healthcare system can't handle the load. I sort of like to think about it is that uh, we need to have this huge problem uh, of how we get the island 
to a level of immunity, it's like drinking from a fire hose. You want to fill a cup. You have to do it very gingerly and do some testing so you can get the water in the cup and not all over yourself. So that's kind of where we are now. And the problem is no one has done this before. There hasn't been anything like this before where you have an illness that people can transmit without being sick. When people had smallpox back in the day, the time of the revolution, you knew they had smallpox because they had pox on them. And that's when they were uh, able to... People cannot transmit the disease without any symptoms. And that makes it a really tough nut to crack. Dr. Drazen, um, I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit about just the disease itself, what this illness is, um, what we know about it so far, and what we don't know about it, and sort of a little bit about how it compares to other illnesses. I think very early on, people were wrongly comparing it to the flu or um, something else that was a little more minor than I think we know it is. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little about how you know what we know about the disease and how lethal it is and some of the peculiar th peculiar things that we've learned about it um, to date. So, uh, this is a virus that you get by inhalation, and that's the reason if you're wearing a mask and you're exposed to things that can be inhaled as droplets, you'll see things if you're uh, standing next to someone that's being really expressive, you can see the droplets come out. Or you talk, you'll know the droplets come out. These are heavy pieces that are like raindrops and they fall to the ground. The other thing that you produce is an aerosol. And these are really light particles that can float in the air and carry with them infectious virus. And so if someone is either speaking or coughing or sneezing, they're creating around them, if they're infected, an infectious cloud. Now you have to inhale enough of that virus so the virus can take hold. It's unlikely that one single virus is enough, but it could be, it depends on where it lands. Think about it planting seeds. If you throw seeds out, you might get a few plants, you might get more than you expected, you might get none. The virus is the same way. And so this virus gets into the respiratory tract, the nose, the throat, and the lungs, and it thrives there. Uh, and it gets into the cell, uh, by using a specific key that it handles, which is what's called a cellular receptor. It gets in and makes copies of itself. And in the process of doing that, uh, causes the cells that line the respiratory tract uh, to get sick and to be inflamed and to die. And that change makes your diffi breathing difficult. You can't get enough oxygen into your lung, from your lungs into your blood, and you get pretty sick from that. And we now know that the inside of blood vessels are very inflamed. And so patients with this illness have a large number of abnormalities of blood clotting. So if you take 100 people and infect them, what we now know is about 30 of those 100 people feel nothing. About 15 of those people get sick enough to be in the hospital. And of those 15, somewhere between three and five get so sick that within the hospital, they need to be in an intensive care unit. There's another group of people that are sick enough to really feel it, but can take care of themselves at home or in a, an infirmary type setting. So the ones that get sick enough uh, to end up in the hospital, some do well with simple care, some can get along with just oxygen. But in some, the disease progresses and during that progression, they require more and more oxygen, and they get to a point where they can't get enough oxygen into their blood to keep themselves alive. And that's when we have to take over for their breathing with the machine called a ventilator. To do that, we put a tube uh, through the nose or mouth into the lungs and then have the machine take over the breathing. Those machines are uh, in short supply, as you've heard. I think we have a few on Nantucket. Uh, but a patient that needs that kind of care needs 24-hour specialized nursing, and those patients would be moved off of Nantucket. Overall, the case fatality rate varies depending on the kind of medical care you have, which is the key issue here. If this were an illness like uh, Ebola, where it was very difficult to save a life once a patient got uh, infected, 
um, it would be different. But this is an illness where if we have the appropriate equipment and the time and expertise, we can save a lot of lives. Many of the people who are dying are dying not because we don't have the ability to get them better, we didn't have the capacity to get them better. And that's why we're trying to keep a control on the rate at which people are getting infected. So this is a really unusual disease in that if you look at the prior two coronaviruses, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus, 30% of the people that got that die, um, but it's very hard to transmit. That was discovered in 2014. 2003, the first SARS virus had moderate transmissibility. Um, the case fatality rate was somewhere between 5 and 10%. Uh, but people who got the illness became sick. They, had, they were febrile. They had symptoms before they were able to transmit it. This illness, because of its very wide spectrum, going from no symptoms to really sick as a dog, makes it really difficult to handle it uh, from a community perspective. Wow. Well, th that's, a, that's an amazing explanation, and I think it's very thorough. We really appreciate that. Um, the questions on YouTube are open. Uh, so if you have any questions for Dr. Drazen, please feel free to, to uh, type any in. Uh, in the meantime, uh, doctor, would you be, there's a conversation that's out there about um, 12 to 18 months for a vaccine and things like that. Can you briefly run us through what that process would look like, um, both from a reg, maybe from a regulatory standpoint, but it may be even from the laboratories or the medical standpoint? So uh, after the uh, first SARS virus came out in 2003, uh, Drug companies went to work on making vaccines, and there were some uh, relatively successful vaccines for that. Uh, but we've eliminated SARS. As far as we can tell, the first version of SARS has fallen off the face of the earth because there weren't enough patients to keep it alive. Uh, we have a number of vac vaccine candidates, different ways of uh, making a vaccine. Some have already started clinical trials. Uh, and they have been doing some of those in Seattle and other parts of the world. So you come up with the vaccine and you need to give it to people in varying doses to find out how much of the protein in the vaccine you need to give to a person before you can fool their body into thinking they've been infected and having uh, an adequate immune response. If you give too little, you don't have an adequate immune response. If you give too much, you may get side effects and the vaccine can't go as far. Right? If you can get away with half the dose, you can vaccinate twice as many people. So they do dose scaling studies to find out what kind of immunity these vaccines have. It takes about four to 10 weeks before the body has a full immune response to this infection. So that means that the vaccine tests, the first round of tests, which were started about a month ago, are gonna have another eight weeks or so to run before they can look at the data and find out whether they gave enough or too much. And then they'll be able to do another cohort. And with that, they'll be able to try test more people and look at the duration of the immunity, whether you need to get a booster like you do with many vaccines, the second shot might be needed to find that out. And let's say that we could do all that by July 1st, which would be a feat and you came up with what we would call a successful candidate vaccine, you would then start doing clinical trials to show that the um, immunity conferred by the vaccine could prevent clinical disease. Uh, because we think it will, but we don't know it will, and it, it will until we actually do those studies. So suppose those studies take another eight to 10 weeks, then we know it works, we wouldn't be guessing, because the next step would be to manufacture hundreds of millions of doses of these vaccines and to give them where they're needed the most at first, but then to vaccinate everybody that is possibly at risk. So that whole process, even if we cut as many corners as possible, it's gonna take a year. Just think about it. Even if we knew on July 1st that this was the candidate vaccine that would work, we got that message. We have to make those vaccines, we have to show that they're quality controlled, and then we have to get them out to the field and administer them. And if it's a single dose, it's great. If it's in more than one dose, it's going to even be a longer thing. So 
a vaccine is clearly the way out, but it's not going to be here soon. So, Dr. Drazen, given that timeline you just described for a vaccine, can we talk a little mm-hmm. bit about the tools that we have now to address the disease and what we're dealing with? And I'm thinking about testing, contact tracing, um, and the quarantining and, and the things, uh, taking the personal measures that we all have heard about. So uh, testing, there are two types of tests. Actually, there are three, but one of them we almost never do. So the, the, the first type of test is the, uh, the test you get when you co- show up at the drive-by booth at Nantucket Cottage Hospital. They take a swab of your throat and your nose, uh, and they put that in a viral transport medium. And from that, they elute uh, the RNA, the ribonucleic acids, which is the core of this, vac- uh, of this virus. And then they put it in a machine that allows it to determine how many copies, if any, of the virus exist. So uh, if there are a lot of copies of the virus, uh, the machine is able to tell you that in fairly short order. If you're a positive, it can give you an answer in five to 10 minutes. If there aren't that many, it keep, it, what it does is it makes a set of copies, and that makes a set of the copies of the copies, and that makes copies of the copies of the copies. And it does that until there are enough of them to register on the machine. And when it does that so many times that the likelihood that there was any virus there at all that you missed is almost zero, then we call that a negative. And that can take, in one of these machines, 15 to 20 minutes. So that's what the the viral uh, RNA test does, the viral nucleic acid test. This is an RNA virus. The other kind of test uses your body's immune response. Uh, and what that can be done is it takes a small sample of blood. For example, if you just prick your finger and put it on a piece of filter paper or a blotting paper, it can make a spot about the size of a quarter. So you have to prick your finger, kind of squeeze it, and get one of these quarter-sized spots. That spot can be dried and then taken to a laboratory, and the proteins eluded from that spot. And we can measure whether your body has had an immune response to this virus. We know exactly what to look for. And that process has also been automated um, and can be done on a dried blood spot. So for example, we could survey the entire community on Nantucket and find out whether the only the 10 people we know about have antibodies to this virus, which would be one extreme, or actually one has died, so it would be nine. Or uh, we could. it might be that there are many people on the island that have, have had this virus, but were asymptomatic and didn't know it. And so uh, that kind of testing would give us an idea of what the prevalence of a disease had been um, in the island over time. Because once you're positive, you're probably positive for months or years. No one knows the exact duration because we haven't had the disease that long. But other coronaviruses, we know people maintain immunity for about two years or more. So those are the two kinds of testing. Uh, It's antibody testing, tells you whether you've been exposed. Nucleic acid testing, RNA or deep PCR testing, tells you whether you have a virus in your body. Neither one of those tells you whether the virus is alive. And the alive virus test uh, needs uh, incubation on tissue culture plates, and that's really only done in a research setting. It's the setting that was used to show that aerosols of this virus can exist in the atmosphere for hours that the virus can survive on plastic surfaces uh, for um, 10 to 12 hours. Um, So it's a research kind of test. Okay. So we have a couple questions from um, the audience. Um, So the first one comes from Michael. Um, And how long do you anticipate social distancing to be going on for? So it's going to depend on where you are. Uh, And here's an example. Take a look at uh, Wuhan, China. They locked down on the 25th of January, and they've now begun to unlock that city um, just in the last week. So that meant a week in January, four weeks in February, four and a half weeks in March, and and then uh, their half of April. And that's when they began to unlock the city. Uh, so uh, that was a, a hotbed. Now, if there isn't much virus circulating, you say, well, we could probably unlock earlier, but then you have a, a population that's at risk. 
And if one person has the virus, comes in, but doesn't have symptoms and spreads it to people, then you have a large population that's at risk. So it's not a simple question uh, and it's a very hard answer. And more difficult, no one has actually ever been through this at this scale with a virus that it could be transmitted before you become symptomatic. And it's that key feature. When I learned about that um, at the end of January, I said to myself, this is gonna be bad. And it's turned out to be true. Yes. Yeah, we all we all looked at it mm-hmm. as uh, we call all of us who had been trained in epidemiology. We looked at it as all a mushroom cloud. So we definitely get that. And then the, the, another question from the audience is: uh, Would you be able to do a quick explanation on herd immunity, assuming that this uh, virus had is permanent immunity, uh, or even if it does not give permanent immunity? Can you run us through a quick version of that? Sure, uh, a, a virus has to find some place to live. It doesn't, it doesn't have any capacity to live on its own. It has to have a host. It's basically a parasite. And so when a virus shows up in somebody's body, if there's no immunity, it can move in. It sets up shop and what does it do? It makes more copies of itself. That's, that's its goal in life. And then it's, it gets uh, coughed out and finds somebody else to do that with. In the meantime, that first patient develops immunity to it and kills the virus, and that patient is now okay and no longer shedding virus. So every time you cough, if you have, if you're, if you're, uh, if you're a viral carrier, the things that you're coughing out has to find somebody that's a susceptible host. Now, if about, and this varies, it depends on the virus, somewhere between two thirds and 80% of a community are such that when somebody coughs, the virus can't find a susceptible host because everybody's immune. That means that it isn't able to make enough copies of itself to sustain itself and it dies out. And that it herd immunity means that within a community, you can't find enough places to live. So another way to think about it is you're pulling into a town and you're looking for a hotel room. If all the hotel rooms are full, you're not gonna make it. And that's what the virus does. It's looking in for a place to live but if all the places to live are not hospitable because the patients are immune, it's not gonna replicate and the virus dies out. It doesn't have to be 100% of people. The data have shown that somewhere between two thirds and four fifths is enough to do it. I really like that uh, hospital analogy, that's excellent. Uh, we know your time is valuable, so we'll go to our last question if that's okay. Um, Uh, we have a question that we hear conversations about antivirals. Um, What's the process for developing an antiviral drug treating COVID-19? And are you aware of any scientists making any progress in developing this sort of therapy? So there's been a lot of work on this. Uh, There are even clinical trials of some antivirals. Remember our treatments for HIV AIDS are all antivirals and they're very successful. They took years to develop. Hopefully we don't have years But people have understood how this virus replicates, and they can think of ways to get in to prevent that replication sequence from working. So now you have this idea that you think works, and you can show that it works in a test tube. And then you can try to show that it works in an animal model, and then you need to try to show that it works in a human model. Uh, Because there are always things that you didn't anticipate that can get, get to you. And the two big things are, will this actually have efficacy in a human model or will it be some side effect which is so severe that even if the drug works the cure is worse than the disease so remdesivir for example is an antiviral that's being tested and there are over half a dozen clinical trials now ongoing to test this drug against a control and the reason we need to do a control is that when you look at the cases in this illness The thing that's really striking is that patients do terrible for somewhere between one and two weeks, and then they have this crisis, and everybody thinks they're going to die, and then they get better on their own. Their immune system finally kicks in enough to kill that virus. And we've seen it over and over again in other settings. Uh, During the Ebola outbreak, we had a a case of someone who looked like he was going to die, and then he got better overnight and he got no treatment other than salt water. So without a control, 
we don't know whether a drug works to kill the virus. So there are control trials that are ongoing. They seem to be well-designed because the designs are all in the public domain. And we all got our fingers crossed that some of these will work. Uh, the antivirals are not inexpensive. They're not easy to produce in quantity. Uh, and they, most of them uh, require uh, injections. So it's not gonna be simple, but we'll have to see. Um, we have our fingers crossed that there can be such. Again, if we found one that worked, we'd have to make enough of it, and that's not easy. Wow. So we've got a long, hard road ahead for us. Um, Dr. Trace. Yeah, we're caught between a rock and a hard place. Uh, yes. <laughs> Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big deal, and uh, we're all working together to try to beat it. Um, Dr. Drazen, we know your time is valuable, and we really appreciate you calling in. Thank you so much. We, we can't even explain how valuable this was and uh, very informative. We Thank you so much. So my heart is with Nantucket. I, my first exposure to Nantucket was when I worked at the Cottage Hospital in the 70s. And I've seen the hospital grow and I've seen the island grow. Um, and it's a wonderful resource. Uh, the island is a wonderful place. We all wanna be able to go out there and play golf or fish, my passion, uh, or do other things. But it's uh, preserving that island to make it something that everybody wants is our goal. So we'll keep it up and we'll work through it. It's not gonna be easy. And uh, remember the words of Piet Hein, the Greek, pardon me, the Dutch uh, philosopher uh, who said, problems worthy of attack prove their worth by hitting back. This is a problem that's hitting back hard. Hang in there. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Thank you so much. And we're preserving Nantucket as much as we can, this beautiful jewel 30 miles out to sea. Thank you, Dr. Drazen. And we will be moving over to our rumor report now. Thank you so much, Dr. Drazen. We really appreciate that phone call and it's been, it's very educational. So we have only two rumors today, uh, two quick ones. Uh, there's a big one that is looming right now. And the question that we've been asked is, can we start work tomorrow? Well, the right now, unfortunately, the when I say can we, we mean the the construction landscaping crews that have been uh, discussed at the Board of Selectmen and, uh, or the Select Board and the Health Depart uh, Board of Health meetings. So what we are asking is that we, you please wait until the Board of Health meeting on Sunday at 1 p.m. Uh, they, they are taking these two back-to-work plans uh, up and, and we'll be hopefully voting on them on Sunday. If you need to look at the back to work plans, the, well, what we're calling the phased work plan, uh, they are on the agendas for the Board of Health meeting on Sunday. If you can't find them, uh, go to nantucket-ma.gov. Uh, on the left, on the drop down menus, you will see under government, you will see it says boards and committees, and then you can drop down to Board of Health and select board. Uh, they, it should be in both of those packets from today. And then uh, the, the next rumor that we have is, does wastewater carry COVID-19? As a matter of fact, it does. Uh, the sewage and uh, things that are in the septic systems, all of that, you shed the virus through that, through your, the human waste. Just like you can cough it out, your body needs to get rid of the virus in some ways. So what we're trying to find out now, because we know that the body sheds and we know the proportion in which the body sheds that, we are actually looking to do a test where we are taking samples of a sewage coming into the sewage treatment plant where we can send that off to a laboratory and find out what the viral load is. That should give us a general estimate of what the population on Nantucket actually has had and is now actively shedding coronavirus. So it's really odd that though while you can, while wastewater does actually have the virus in it, it is very informative and we're using every tool possible to move forward and find out how COVID-19 is affecting the island and how we can move forward with that information. So now we will continue to provide you with updates on the coronavirus and its impact for Nantucket.
please tune in to watch Nantucket Pulse's wellness series hosted by Natalie Simonero with our local health professionals on Channel 18 and nctv18.org. It airs at 12, uh, 12.30 p.m. on weekdays and at 4 p.m. On, on the weekend. Please share this with, with friends and family. It's designed to connect with our viewers with local health professionals that can help us take care of ourselves and others around us. Please sign up for NCTV's newsletter by going to nctv18.org, scrolling to the bottom of the homepage, and adding your email address to the newsletter box. It's free and will make you among the first to hear about our new programming, official statements from the town, live coverage, and much more. As the pandemic continues, it's important that communications remain in place as events continue to unfold and we all remain connected. It's crucial to get the facts from your local news sources such as the Inquirer and Mirror, 97.7 ACK-FM Radio, and NCTV Channel 18. It is also crucial that we continue to stay at home unless you are considered essential personnel. To the medical staff, grocery store workers, police, firefighters, power company workers, ferry staff, DPW, and other essential workers around Nantucket, we at Pulse and residents across Nantucket would like to say thank you for keeping the island running and safe. Don't just take it from me. Take it from the people who submitted the following videos to share in a round of applause. We want to thank all the essential workers and medical professionals on island and around the world for working hard to keep us safe. Thank you. We are so very appreciative and we'd like to clap for you. Thank you for everything you're doing for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And before I sign off, I want to share something that might often go overlooked during this pandemic. This week, some Nantucketers celebrated their birthday. In order to mark the occasion, in place of a party, friends and family took to the streets. Nantucket Pulse wants to wish Pauline Proach, Executive Director of the Egan Maritime, and Jillian Fraker, teacher at the Lighthouse School, a very healthy and happy birthday. If you missed it, stay tuned to see for yourself their unique birthday celebrations. Have a nice weekend and stay safe. I'm Roberto Santa Maria, your Health and Human Services Director for the Island of Nantucket. <laughs> Are they for me? Yeah! No, <laughs> front. Bye. Happy birthday! <laughs> 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 <laughs>
day getting to check in with my students and then right after my 11:30 zoom student i um there was a knock at my back door and there's my family saying we had to go look at something at the end of the driveway okay i have to be back in a few minutes um and then i started to hear voices and we got to the end of the driveway and that's when i thought wait a second that sounds like a couple of my students and then i look out and they're spaced out just across the street from the windmill and i kind of started to get what was happening and it blew me away. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to Jillian. Happy birthday to you. So the parents of all the kids in my class, I'm guessing, put it together. Um, and I, it doesn't surprise me. I'm so supported by all of them all the time, and they're always offering words of encouragement, and they're so kind. It's definitely a birthday I'll never forget, that's for sure. And, uh, you know, I think it's such a hard time for everyone, and this, this just, I've been smiling all day, and, I'll, and it'll keep my smile going for a long time. I, I, can't, I can't tell you how much it meant to me.